it all began when I was at school when I read about the housemaster at Charterhouse School in Godalming in Surrey in England called Mallory, who was last seen climbing the north face of Mount Everest with one of his old students, Irvin, also from Charterhouse. And Mallory was asked when he came back from his third expedition, second expedition, because it was on the third that he disappeared, at a party in England by a gushing lady. Why do you want to climb Mount Everest? And Mallory, wanting to get rid of her, turned, said and turned around, because it is there. Because it is there became a kind of explanation for the motivation behind mountain climbing. Actually, there's a lot more than that. Particularly in the Alpine Club and the European mountain climbing circles. In India, it's been a little different. The Himalayan Club started with genuine idealism like the Alpine Club and the European Climbers Clubs. But with independence, and particularly after the foundation of the Indian Mountaineering Foundation and the first Chou expedition, it became a kind of ambition to climb so that the government would give you rewards for climbing. Most Indian government officials and most, not all, climbed mountains because they were promoted when they came back with successful expeditions and they for example I don't want to take names uh, Everest, successful Everest expeditions successful Kumau and Garhwal expeditions successful Nepal expeditions the leaders and climbers were allotted plots of land free or cheap they were given flats free or cheap, they were promoted in the rank, next rank or the higher rank of their service. So mountaineering was not always idealistic in India, it was an advantage to be able to climb mountains to gain promotion or pelf or property. And yet the Alpine Club tradition and the European tradition continued to motivate some of the best climbers of India. So when we were at the Dune School trying to climb mountains and even before that when we were I was trying to climb Black Peak with BP Singh uh, with uh, just 50 rupees as our expedition funding and ice access made in Jama Masjid by ourselves. At that time, mountaineering was still in its infancy in India. People like Jack Gibson and Roy Greenwood and John Martin and John Kemp and others motivated a younger generation of Indian mountain climbers, generally beginning with the Dune School in the Mayo College, particularly the Dune School, which became a kind of cradle or nursery of mountain climbing schoolmasters like Gurudeyal Singh and Amir Ali and Nalini Jayal and all inspired by Jack Gibson and the Bandapunch Mountains. I was with the Statesman newspaper as a journalist in 1960 when the Chou expedition, no, Chou came much later. When I met Jack Gibson and it was then that I decided I wanted to be a schoolmaster and not a journalist. And when the first Mount Everest expedition was organized and Brigadier Gyan Singh was given the leadership, it had been in fact Gurdayal Singh who had been asked to lead. But then Gurdayal being a good schoolmaster and not a government or services officer, did not seem to get along too well with the setup of government under the then Prime Minister, who did have some interest at a distant level in an armchair way against about the Himalaya 
and wildlife and forests. I joined the Doon School in 1959. And thereafter, when we went to Nanda Devi in 1960 and again in 1961, in 62 when Everest, the third attempt was organized by the Indian government and the Indian Mountaineering Foundation, I think, we were automatically sort of part of it. But even then, it was sport and nothing to do with psychophancy or promotion or material advantage which motivated us. So John Martin was the headmaster of the Doon School at that time and it, he was very generous in letting both Gurdyal Singh and me. I was also a schoolmaster, he was a schoolmaster at the Doon School uh, to give us some le extra leave because we would have had to take leave to be able to report to the expedition at Jainagar, at the border of Nepal, sometime in April, I think it was, or March. And uh, we landed up in Jainagar at the inspection bungalow there, which had a bit of a courtyard and garden, not a garden really, it was a very untidy lawn, which had been, at some stage, it must have been a very good inspection bungalow. And we started repacking all our equipment and food and rations and supplies which would have to be carried by porters all the way to the base camp of Everest. But particularly across the foothills and below from the Shivalik hills of Nepal from Jainagar which is a subdivision below the Shivalik hills in Bihar. So at Jainagar we were I remember <laughs> fetted by the marigold garlands by Colonel Jaiswal, who was the, the principal of the Himalayan Mountaineering Institute at that time. And he came, came there with plus fours and mountaineering regalia, looking very, very smart, as colonels generally do, giving us, asking us to all sit down on the, in front of him, of the veranda of the inspection bungalow which we didn't want to really do, but we did, and giving us a speech, just like Pandit Nehru would have given us a speech, saying, Oh, the glorious mountains of Chomolungma, and touching the heavens, God is there, and you are going there, and you have my blessings, and I give you my full support. And he kept on and on and on, a colonel who had never been to the mountains and was not really interested. But we kept quiet, and we were polite. And he went away and we had Ang Tharke was ready to come with us. Ang Tharke, the great cook and head Sharpa of earlier expeditions. And the deputy commissioner, no, the sub-divisional magistrate was an IAS officer, I remember, from the Doon School called Adige, Srinivas Rao Adige, who was the sub-divisional magistrate of Jainagar. And so he gave me his jeep and he said, you want to get more porters from the villages on the towards the border? And I drove all the way. I think Gurdjian was with me. And we came back with a, another 100 or 200 or 300 porters because I think in the end we had something like a thousand porters carrying our baggage first through the rice fields and then to, into the forests below the Shivalik hills and then over the Shivalik hills and across into the Dune area. The UN means actually longitudinal valleys between the Shivalik hills and the Himalayas, like Dehra Dune, like the Patli Dune, like Corbett Park. And uh, so as we moved up from across the Shivaliks, another band of porters took over from these plainsmen bands of, band of porters and took our baggage and the train, long train would start off in the morning, every day we would camp somewhere in a nice area separately from the porters, good fraternization, we had membership was, I think we had a dozen members, very fine people, John Dyers was our leader, he was I think 8th uh, Garhwal Rifles and uh, one of the finest officers of the Indian Army, and the Indian Army always had some very fine officers. 
even though Pandit Nehru said that he didn't need an army, till he realized in 1962, this was this month, the, this very expedition here, that uh, what he had done was to dis actually very treacherously through ego betray India by letting China take over parts of Arunachal Pradesh and Ladakh. And never have so many Indian officers and men been killed as in the days of Pandit Nehru in that war. Even now the secrets of the Henderson Brooks report have not been revealed because it would show the post-independence leadership of India in very poor light. Anyway, we were lucky that finally we started moving out of the small hill town of Okhaldunga into the higher ranges of what were called Jantar Dham, where there was frost on the grass and no habitation except for grasslands and conifer forests and rhododendron forest. And we were finally into middle, the middle hills of the Himalaya. It took us another 10 days to get to Lukla Airport airstrip, which is on a very high, uh, steep gradient, so that air aircraft like this pilotus porter Swiss aircraft can land and take off. And we were able to walk past this airstrip and down to the Botekosi Valley and into Namche Bazaar. From there, the Sherpas took over. And uh, Sherpa Tenzing, in fact, had already arranged for us a large number of porters from Kumjung, from Namchi, from uh, all the vill Sherpa villages. And it was a two very fine days at Namchi Bazaar. We spent packing and repacking and going on to Thiangkochi Monastery where the monks gave us a welcome, where we camped for. It was a pleasure to be camped at Thiangbochi Monastery, where the, we were hard, almost a week at the Thiangbochi Monastery camp of the Everest Expedition 1962. was a delight and a pleasure, because we were given an audience with the head lama, and there was a dance in our honor and a feast and we had daily very good chang and yak meat and the monastery itself is on a spur of the Amadablam peak which has not been had not been climbed by then at that time and uh, we were in the every morning we would go off with one or two climbers each act to acclimatize and get used to the higher mountains and we would climb up these spurs where I saw the blood pheasants and the thar somewhat unafraid because of the monastery surrounding which later on became the national park known as the Sagarmatha National Park and uh, it is here that I first began to see through the motivations of Indian mountaineers. For example, I, again, I don't think it would be right for me to quote names, but one of my morning climb companions was a government junior service officer. And we were going to do nothing very serious. We were just going up to, across the Imjikola, below the Thangthangmoche Monastery, and climb up a small peak lip, which is only about 18,000 or 17,500 feet. And there had been fresh snow overnight, so the grass slopes were covered with frost, and the rock slopes were covered with almost ice or uh, sleet, so they were slippery. 
ice axes were not very useful and so we roped up. While we were about to reach this very modest target summit for that day as our training, there was one Sharpa and there was one other, this gentleman and I, and we had one or two slips, not very serious, nothing would be very serious in that area, but we were, there was a tendency to slip because of the frost on the ice and the sleet on the rock. And halfway to the last pitch, the gentleman said, Harry, I think we should go back. This is dangerous. So I said, how can we go back? We're just there. Why don't we just think of Everest, this is nothing. And his heels and toes started shivering on the rock face out of fear and he wet his windproof trousers out of sheer fear. And this is the gentleman who climbed many other mountains later on and is considered one of the great mountaineers of India. Anyway, so I never mentioned this to anybody. I've never mentioned this. For, this is the first time I'm saying this. Another time, another companion who was with me had a similar experience and this time he didn't actually have incontinence but he certainly uh, began to smell of fear. I could smell him. I didn't know that there was a smell of fear. It's something to do with pheromones. Pheromones? Pheromones. Pheromones. He was smelling. So I thought, what is he smelling of? I realized he was smelling of fear. He was it was a kind of contagious fear. It was reaching me because I was on the same rope with him behind him. So I decided at that time that I would try to be very careful through the ice fall in Everest not to be on the same rope as these people because the others were not necessarily like them. But the motivations were different here. And both of them got promoted. Both of them became very famous people because they had gone to Everest 1962 and they, one of them, in fact, went to Everest in 1965 and was one of the nine people, Indians, uh, under the captainship, leadership of Captain Kohli of the Navy Education Corps, who actually climbed the summit of Everest. But it was also great fun. I, had rem I remember I had carried with me a pair of skis in my rucksack baggage. And uh, Whenever an opportunity occurred, I was able to go up Herringbone and climb, ski down. S slushy slopes, but as you went higher up Periche and uh, up the Rongbuk, uh, up, up the uh, Everest, uh, is it the Thiangbuji, or uh, Kumbu Glacier, the snow slopes and navy on the either, uh, particularly on the north face north side became harder and firmer well i was quite used to having very modest equipment because i didn't ever buy an ice axe we made it in jama masjid through a very fine bearded muslim character who was a luhar and he had with him a carpenter and so i gave him all the designs and he made me an ice axe similarly the ice the skis I was using on Everest 62 were not Attenhofer or uh, European skis or American skis. They were skis made at the Forest Research Institute in Dehradun with the help of Professor Masani, whose two sons were studying at the Dune School with me. And he was in charge of the timber workshop. And he had created all kinds of new kinds of uh, uh, timber plies which had been joined together and the, the ski boot traps and clamps had been made in the Dune School workshop. We had a good workshop there uh, and the boys had helped me and we'd made it with the help of what Jack Gibson had done earlier though Jack had skis and Ro Holdsworth was very much part of the Royal Ski Club of Great Britain so they had very good skis. I, I didn't have these skis and uh, it was a pleasure to be able to use your own skis as we went up the Kumbu Glacier. 
And finally, we reached the base camp of Gumbu Glacier, below Pimori on the north and Lola on the no north, north uh, west, northeast, across which you could occasionally, if you climbed up, see Cho Oyu. And Kumbu Glacier flowing down through Sirax and ice, ice crevasses and ice boulders uh, from the south call of Mount Everest, with Nupse on the south and Mount Everest with its plume of high wind on the east and northeast. John Dyers used to have evening and morning meet, not meetings, but uh, sort of gatherings of all the climbers every day at the base camp uh, to work out the teams and to work out the logistics for the next day and who would do what. And it was a pleasure always to be in those meetings and we were given our, assigned our various jobs, carrying loads to the, from the base camp to camp one, which would include planning for the crossing of the Great Crevasse, which is the, runs right across the Kumbu Glacier between camp one and camp two. And uh, I was assigned a rope with Group Captain A.K. Chaudhary, who was at that time, I think he was a wing commander or a squad leader. Chao, we used to call him, very fine bold officer, very good climber. Later on became the principal of the HMI Darjeeling and I think he was also principal of the NIM Mutukashi, but I'm not sure. And Chao and I and Navang Hillap of Porche village and Nima of Kumjung village were the rope of four who were assigned to break to open the route to Camp 2. So after Camp 1 had been established by others, 